Hi there, everyone. Welcome back to 3 News Now. I'm Stephanie Haney, and today is Thursday, July 22nd. Today's a very special day. Thank you for being here for the top stories from WKYC.com and our WKYC app. Today is a special day here in Northeast Ohio because it's Cleveland's birthday. Today is Cleveland's 200. 25th birthday today marks the day that Moses Cleveland pulled up on the Cuyahoga River and thought this is a fine place for a little town and now here we are and Cleveland is shining bright in all its beauty there was a nice little event happening in Public Square earlier today we live streamed that on WKYC.com if you want to check that out and we'll have some fun things coming for you to celebrate today being Cleveland Day in our shows we did post on our Facebook page, we want to know what is your favorite thing about Cleveland that is the most Cleveland to you. So head there, post on our Facebook post asking for that, and let us know. And we'll talk about it in the 5 o'clock show today on What's New. In other news today, big news. First Energy has been charged and agrees to pay a $230 million penalty in connection with the House Bill 6 bribery scheme. First Energy agreed to pay that penalty and connected with the $60 million alleged bribery scheme involving former House Speaker Larry Householder. Now, the company was charged federally with conspiring to commit honest services wire fraud and admitted to conspiring to pay public officials in exchange for specific official action that would benefit the company. The U.S. Attorney's Office said in part, here's a quote, the company signed a deferred prosecution agreement that could potentially result in dismissal of the charge. That means the prosecution has been delayed, and if all things are complied with as part of the agreement, the charge could very well be completely dismissed. Now, this comes just one year after Householder and four of his associates were arrested in connection with the scandal, which then U.S. Attorney David DeVillers described as the largest corruption scandal in the state of Ohio's history. Householder has pleaded not guilty, and since then he was re-elected to the House here in Ohio, but he was recently kicked out of office by his colleagues in the Ohio House. In other news, Ohio Attorney General Yost has announced that there will be a $26 billion settlement with drug distributors Johnson & Johnson, which will end opioid lawsuits. Now, this is a nationwide settlement, not just $26 billion just for the state of Ohio. The three biggest U.S. drug distribution, company, distribution companies and the drug maker Johnson & Johnson have agreed to this $26 billion settlement. This is for their roles in the open, in the opioid epidemic. Now, they face thousands of similar legal claims from state and local governments, just as have been filed here in Ohio across the country, and they've been looking to try to settle them all. Now, the companies involved in this settlement are Amerisource Bergen, Cardinal, and McKesson as well. The three distributors will pay up to $21 billion over 17 years. Johnson & Johnson will pay up to $5 billion over nine years, with $3.7 billion paid during the first three years. The total funding distributed will be determined by the overall participation in both litigating and non-litigating states and local governments. Not every state has to necessarily sign on to the settlement. A substantial portion of the money has to be spent on opioid treatment and prevention. And each state's share of the funding has been determined by agreement among the states. Now, this is using a formula that takes into account the impact of the opioid crisis on each particular state. Ohio hit very hard at ground zero for carfentanil coming in here to the to the U.S. And it will also take into account the number of overdose deaths, the number of residents with substance use disorder, and the number of opioids prescribed in the population of the state. Here's a big thing. Johnson & Johnson has also been ordered to stop selling opioids. Also, they cannot fund or provide grants to third parties for promoting opioids. They can't lobby on activities related to opioids. They have to share clinical trial data under the Yale University Open Data Access Project. And they will also have to require their senior corporate officials to take part in regular oversight of anti-diversion efforts. This investigation looked into whether Johnson & Johnson misled patients and doctors about the addictive nature of opioid drugs. A government report has recently revealed that overdose deaths rose to a record 93,000 last year in the COVID-19 pandemic. Franklin County Coroner in the Columbus area, Anahi Ortiz, said the county had seen nearly a 46% increase in overdose deaths last year compared to 2019. 
Here in Northeast Ohio, a former Cleveland employee is testifying that he was involved with fake timesheets for years, allowing council member Ken Johnson to claim thousands in phony expenses. That trial is underway here in Northeast Ohio. Federal prosecutors said in opening statements on Wednesday that 75-year-old Ken Johnson is a cheat and a liar who manipulated people close to him in three different schemes to defraud taxpayers out of tens of thousands of dollars. So on the first day of the trial yesterday, pro prosecutors focused on reimbursements that he received for expenses that he claimed he paid for out of his own pocket to help clean and cut up vacant lots in his east side ward. The key witness was Robert Fitzpatrick. He testified that Johnson befriended him when he was a boy and that he later moved in to Johnson's home. He talked about fake timesheets and fake tax documents that were used in order for Johnson to claim reimbursement. Fitzpatrick said that he filled out timesheets to match hours given to him on a piece of paper each week by him. He told reporters he didn't know why he was filling out the timesheets. Fitz Fitzpatrick testified the signatures on those receipts that alleged that the council member paid him 1200 each month are fake and that he never signed a single receipt and he never got a penny. Now, Fitzpatrick has already pleaded guilty for his role in the scheme, and he said that he didn't like doing it because he ended up having to pay taxes on income that he did not receive. Now, Johnson's lawyers argue in their opening statements that Johnson kept sloppy records and paperwork, but that everything he did was for the residents of the ward, and he is a true public servant. This trial is expected to last a couple of weeks. We could hear from some top officials in Cleveland. Now, taking a look on the COVID-19 front, studies are now indicating that COVID-19 causes brain damage, even in mild cases. There is a new study of brain scans before and after COVID. It's found evidence of that damage. Dr. Louise McCulloch treats patients with neurological long hauler symptoms at the UT Physicians Post-COVID-19 Clinic. She said they've been following 700 patients there and that they looked and found dramatic increases in brain injury markers in the blood of people with COVID. Also, a study done in the United Kingdom has found something similar. Researchers had brain scans from over 700 patients there, which were done before the pandemic, and then they did second MRIs around three years after that first scan. 394 of those patients between the ages of 59 and 63 years old got the virus between the two scans. Those who recovered from COVID had more brain atrophy or shrinkage in parts of the brain that control taste, smell, and memory. And most of those COVID cases were mild. Now, the question is, 20 years from now, will this be a public health crisis? Could it potentially contribute to Alzheimer's disease? And Dr. McCulloch says that's a very good question, that this kind of brain damage that we're seeing here is typically permanent. And she thinks it's critical now that more research be done on this long hauler symptom, because if doctors can figure out why COVID-19 is causing this chronic effect on the brain, that hopefully they can find ways to help. Now, bummer news if you are a Rolling Stones fan. The Rolling Stones have canceled their tour date here in Cleveland for their 2021 No Filter Tour. They confirmed initially that they were coming to Cleveland with a lot of fanfare. They had their iconic tongue logo on Terminal Tower, but it got postponed because of COVID-19 and rescheduled because of COVID-19. And today, when they released their official tour dates for 2021... Cleveland was not on it. It was due to a rescheduling conflict, according to the team, according to Ticketmaster, and the email went out, and they said that people who had tickets will get the first chance at tickets for nearby locations, that being Pittsburgh and Detroit. They'll get early access to that, or you can get a full refund. The new tour kicks off in St. Louis, Missouri, and that's in September. And it ends November 20th in Austin, Texas. So if that's you and you got those tickets and you're interested in Detroit or potentially Pittsburgh, you will get an opportunity to have early access to those ticket sales. But here is some good news. Live Nation is celebrating the return of concerts with $20 tickets to almost 1,000 shows. It's an all-in ticket, so that's your fees and everything, the whole deal. There will be a pre-sale on uh, Tuesday, July 27th at noon. That's for T-Mobile and Sprint customers. And then tickets to the general public open up on Wednesday, July 28th. They'll be sold through LiveNation.com. Again, that $20 ticket includes taxes and feeds. So there are a limited number available, but they will be available while supplies last. And a, and a wide variety, by the way, of performers. You've got 311, Zach Brown, the Jonas Brothers, Kiss, Luke Bryan, that's just to name a few. So if you're interested in that, check that out. We've got that lineup on WKYC.com. Now, if you've been following Downtown's development, which is something 
very appropriate to talk about today on Cleveland's birthday. The Ohio Department of Transportation has just awarded $2.5 million to the city of Cleveland for the proposed Haslam Sports Group Lakefront development. This is really to turn the lakefront area into something that's a little more interconnected but this award is to further the study of this proposal so again very much at the beginning stages of this project and the city of Cleveland will match those funds so that's five million dollars now committed to the project now this plan calls for a land-like bridge over state right state route 2 and the railroad tracks the hope is to connect the area around first energy stadium the Great Lakes Science Center and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with the rest of town town which it is connected by East 9th Street and also West 3rd Street, but something in the middle there would be nice. And that's what it would do to the mall area by the Huntington Convention Center in that area right there where you can overlook First Energy Stadium. Now, the proposal calls for combined private and public money to help pay for this. It's estimated to cost $230 million. So this $5 million is quite a quite a drop in the bucket to that total $230 million. But again, just in the research phase right now, the city of Cleveland in a joint statement with the Haslam Sports Group says they will start with this now. The next steps would then be selecting vendors to do the job and then project agreement. So again, many, many steps to go through. But things are moving forward. Speaking of moving forward or backwards, I should say, Team USA gymnast Simone Biles showed off the vault that no female gymnast has ever done in Olympic competition today, just while she was warming up at the Olympics in uh, Tokyo. It's called the Yurchenko Double Pike Vault. What it is, it's a round off onto a springboard, a back handspring onto the vault, and then a piked double backflip to the landing. And she almost stuck the landing it was pretty beautiful. Back in May, she was the first woman to ever land the move during competition. Now, in order to have it named after her, she would have to land it in a major competition like the Olympics. Biles already has four moves named after her, by the way. One on the vault, one on the balance beam, and two on the floor routine. And she is the favorite to win the all-around gymnastics gold again this year. I love the floor gymnastics. That's my favorite thing. My favorite thing to watch. She's also making uh, news today because she is the first female athlete with her own Twitter hashtag. Twitter Sports showed off the newest hashtag emoji. If you tweet hashtag Simone or hashtag Simone Biles, you will also see a little emoji pop up that is a goat wearing a leotard and a gold medal. And if you're not in the know, goat stands for greatest of all time. And that is definitely Simone Biles. As we gear up to watch the Tokyo Olympics, NBC is your home for that. And that means 3 News is your home for that. And we will be covering it all over the place, online, on the air. The opening ceremony will take place on Friday, 8 p.m. local time in Japan. That's 7 a.m. here on Friday, by the way. They're 13 hours ahead in Japan. So that'll be live on Channel 3. And we will be streaming the events live. So make sure you check that out. WKYC.com slash Olympics is your destination for that. And also make sure you're following us on Twitter at WKYC for those up to the minute updates and all of those reminders of when your favorite events are about to go live. Also make sure you download that NBC Sports app. You can check out NBCOlympics.com and get the WKYC app as well. You're going to want those push notifications because we'll be following those big moments because we've got about a dozen Northeast Ohio athletes in the Olympics this year, my friends. All right, that's it for 3 News Now today for Thursday, July 22nd on this Moses Cleveland Day. Again, happy birthday to Cleveland. I will see you next up on What's New with your trending stories in the Clicking in Cleveland segment. And I will see you back here tomorrow for more 3 News Now.